Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Fredland. And as always, we are joined by our illustrious panel. Uh, thanks to our official sponsor, Running Aces Racetrack Casino and Hotel, and our other podcast sponsors, Learn Pro Poker and Website Amp. This is episode 184, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're actually going to take a section of content from our membership program. So part of being a member at Rec.Poker is you have access to this amazing content, uh, including a monthly seminar. Every month, Chris Jones leads putting this together. A bunch of us are involved, and we put together this great seminar, which leads throughout the month, sort of a theme for the month, uh, and that's available to all of our members at Rec.Poker. Uh, for July, uh, we are going to be talking about bluffing, and so we thought this would be a great opportunity to take a section of that and communicate it with all of you folks who might not even be aware that we do have a membership site, uh, Wrecked Out Poker. We're actually in the process of relaunching that. Uh, that should be out anytime. Uh, early July, probably at the latest, we should have a new revamped membership site uh, out there with an opportunity to engage with other people, to have discussion forums, to connect with others. Uh, and then all kinds of amazing content, other great opportunities, play and hangs, all kinds of really cool stuff for a really low price. So check that out. But today we're going to take a section from that seminar uh, and talk about that. What? And one more thing I wanted to bring up. Last week we talked about the National Collegiate Poker Tour being spearheaded by Justin Cole. And one of our own Rec Poker Nation faithful uh, got in touch with Justin. We had a great conversation. And as a result... Uh, the University of Iowa added a poker team to their roster. So if if you have connections at a university that think, man, we should form a poker team, get in touch with me. I can connect you with Justin or get in touch with the National Collegiate Poker Tour directly. But he said, See, uh, week one was a success. Here are the results. Uh, team Bing Binghamton University crushed the competition. They won the team prize. Well, UCCS's Julian Ace of Monsters Elizondo took first place for the individual prize. So congratulations to Julian. Congratulations to Binghamton University on your success in week one. And then finally, remember, uh, we have the special deal with Red Chip Poker. You go to Red Chip Poker uh, slash Rec Poker. Use the code Rec Poker and get one free week of core training as well. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to jump right in. This is a section from our seminar on bluffing that's available to our members throughout the month of July and beyond. All of the archived content remains available to members as well. So take a listen and enjoy. We'll catch you on the flip side. Um, let's talk about floats because um, this is something that I think comes up and that people uh, maybe don't uh, understand or whatever as, as, as well. So... Um, <laughs> So um, we have a, this is a under an early position open. We're in the big blind again with seven, eight. Um, we uh, have not really hit this hand, but it's somewhat hit our range. The King obviously favors the opener. Um, the rest of this kind of favors us. Uh, we have very little potential equity in this. Um, and you could argue, why are you even in this hand? Why aren't you just folding? And that you could very rightly say that. But if we're deep enough, um, this is a spot where you can sometimes call a continuation bet from your opponent, which is called a float, because you have uh, you're you're intending to take it away on later streets. Um, and one of the things that um, what calling here does is it's a lot. Like you could potentially, of course, just check raise, right? But I feel like the the float in this spot gives you a lot more options on later streets than than check raising. Um, yeah, and of course you can fold as well. But um, this is a spot where sometimes, not all the time, don't just say, "Oh, this is now my new practice," because you're going to get into a lot of trouble if you do this very often. Um, but sometimes you can call a C bet here and wait for turn cards. Um, if the turn in this sort of spot is a, basically a two through six, a spade, um, we're in pretty good situation to try to turn the tables. We're going to talk about uh, some of those, what a little bit more when we get into the story section about what those uh, spots are. But um 
there there's a lot of uh, spots here where we can sort of turn the tables, even when we've got very little equity. Um, it, thoughts? It, it, well, and definitely there's there's you know you only the later the later the street you're making your bluff, the more likely that you're gonna win some extra chips along the way because either by making a multi street bluff by bluffing the flop with the expectation of taking it away on the turn or calling a flop bet with the expectation of expectation of taking it away on a turn. You, you know, um, if someone just folds to your first bluff, you only get what's in the pot already. But if you have something, if you have a note, and I'm, I'm typically, this is going to be on opponents that you have some information on where you know how they play turns or on boards, like Chris has pointed out here, where the next, the turns likely to bring a card that makes a one pair hand feel vulnerable. Um, and that's really what we're looking for here. Uh, you know, expectation that you're going to get in a spot on the next street where you can, um, make someone make a one pair hand feel scared. Yeah. These are sometimes most effective, um, when you call a C bet and the turn goes check, check, and the board has degraded significantly, so that if our opponent is, say, holding king queen on this board, and now suddenly it's um, two, three, four, five with three spades, um, it's it's a it's a real that's a real good board to try to take a shot on the river. Mm-hmm. And we have to realize the board can change in favor of the in, in position or the aggressor as well. Because uh, any ace, queen, king uh, hurts us. The king isn't necessarily bad, but an ace is kind of terrible. Yeah. Um, where if we were planning on floating, uh, we have to be wary of the hand, the uh, cards that actually like counter our proposal to float and then try and be aggressive later. And then yeah. uh, f- floating, it it can be a dangerous thing. Um, the one thing that makes it super dangerous in this spot is that we're out of position. Uh, if we're in position, uh, we just get that piece of information of how our opponent kind of views the hand. So here, uh, Chris mentioned, if it goes check, check, it gives us a great opportunity on the river, which it definitely does. Uh, but if we flip and put ourselves in position, uh, all it takes is our opponent to check the turn. And now, uh, we can turn our float into two streets of aggression rather than just one street, uh, which is kind of what our plan was on this example. But if we're in position now, we can bet both the turn and the river um, and kind of start telling that story of we have a better hand than you. Mm-hmm. And just one note for uh, Poker Tracker users um, we're talking about floats here, as in calling a flop bet with no real equity in the hand, but just as an, as an expectation that you're going to bluff later. Um, I think Poker Tracker also uses the term float to refer to a bet um, on the flop where the other player had an opportunity to see bet and did not. Uh, so just a terminology check. It, it means a couple different things in different places. But if you hear it out on the street, this is what they mean here. This is, <laughs> Chris is talking street float here. And one of the one of the things about this situation here is, if you call on the on the flop, a lot of players are very turn honest. So, in other words, they could be taking a stab at this with a C bet, um, and then the minute they the minute you call, they shut down. So when they check you check back on the turn, it's a definite great opportunity to bet out on the river as a total bluff. Um, and I don't even know that you need to have a two, six or a spade show up. You know, you could, you could really do it um, with just about any run out. And if, if uh, they've checked on the turn, they've, they've pretty much given up unless you're Steve Fredlin, of course, because yeah. he's, he's going to slow play that thing. And he's going to say, well, I miss, I underrepresented my hand. <laughs> and then he's going to call you with the King Jack. Right. So, other than that, though, I think you can get away with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do like what Taylor. I mean, like if if an ace came on the river, I would not continue with that that um, that plan because um, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree, yeah. I agree. Yeah. But again, I was I was more talking about the type of opponent 
right that is very turn on us so that you know that they have nothing um if they don't bet out on the turn yep um okay so another um one it, that is you know as we as we get through all of these uh we're getting to so the more complicated style of bluffs they're also the ones that can get you into more trouble so just be aware of that but these are uh potential uh bluffs and the 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 scare card is a very effective one um we've all been in the position uh where we're holding um ace king on a king five three all club board um and we're like oh well okay i got i got my king that's pretty cool and then the nine of clubs comes on and we don't we have ace king of diamonds and the nine of clubs comes on the turn and we're like oh, God. oh boy i just said uh, oh, hang on right and you just hope your opponent is just as scared of that turn as you are um but so if um if we're in this type of spot and we've got we don't have ace king we're in the the big blind we've got seven six of diamonds and we see our opponent again check back that turn uh or if we're in position like taylor was talking about if we see them check the turn to us uh after that nine of clubs comes um this can be a, a very effective spot to bet um pretty big um but it's again not one i recommend you do all the time you got to pick these spots very carefully pick your opponents very carefully um but it is very hard to call um this kind of board with king queen or ace king uh with no club um yeah other thoughts about scare cards and you know this the same thing's true of four, uh four lines to straights where somebody just needs the you know the one card to make a straight um four to a flush um you know, there's the, those are pretty much the the really big scare cards that come up. Yeah, I like to think a lot about uh, ranges of players, especially in these types of spots. Uh, so, like in this example here, like the most likely person to have the ace of clubs here is actually the early position player, um, and they can get deceptive and check back the turn, knowing that they have the nuts and they're only going to get paid if your opponent bets. Um, so thinking about those types of situations, I think of it as a really effective small to mid size, uh, for bet size, uh, for the big blind to bluff on this river. Um, cause you don't have the nut nut advantage. Like it's unlikely for you to have the ace of clubs in this spot, but it is pretty darn likely for you to have like the queen jack or 10 of clubs, which in those cases you'd probably bet medium size hoping that you don't get raised by your opponent if the turn was instead the ace of clubs in this spot now all of a sudden i think it becomes a really good spot to up that bet size because now your opponent has to have the queen of clubs uh to be calling down and it's a little bit less likely because they don't open all their queens uh, it's more likely for them to open their aces in this spot uh, so you can actually upsize if that ace of clubs comes out at least how I'm viewing it uh, and use it as a more effective bluff. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, lastly, I think this is the last one of the, yeah. Okay. So lastly, in this sort of like string of like um, complicated, you know, this is one of the ones where uh, I, I do this once every other tournament. You know, this is not something you do all the time, but I think of the spots where I can find um, where I can do a really big, like check to somebody who I think has a very good hand and then like check, raise them all in on the river with some blockers um, because, um, you know, I, I you know, I, I feel like they don't have the nuts or in this particular situation, I know they don't. Um, and um, these can be very effective, but they're also very dangerous because also one of the things I think that, that uh, a lot of, you know, people smarter than me talk about when they talk about the psychology of poker is that people really don't like folding rivers, especially rivers where they've already put money in. Uh, it takes a very disciplined player to 
um, maybe bet one or two streets, get to a river, you check, they bet, and then you raise them all in and they're able to fold because they, they pretty much have a pretty strong holding at that point. So there are arcade players, you need to pick your customer for this. Um, but because we have the Ace of Diamonds, we, uh, in this particular spot, we know, uh, and actually because we have a five, we're blocking both straights and the, the nut flush. So we have a lot of reasons that uh, we can put in a really big bluff bet here. And our opponent is going to have a tough time calling. Um, and they're, they're going to have a tough time calling just because there's just fewer combinations of value hands in their range because we're just blocking those combinations of hands. I know Chris is going to get into this shortly, but this is, this is, this is the opposite of a villain dependent move is what I want to say. This is, this is a move that Chris is going to make because of the way his actual hand is interacting with the board. Um, and he, and he has the villain has a propensity to fold to river bluffs, of course, but um, that's what makes this hand a good choice versus another hand specifically because you're actually making it, less likely that they have a, a calling hand. And what's great is we've told the story of a flush draw that got there and finally hit. Like if we, you know, break this apart and read the story again that Chris wrote here. So, you know, we call a small C bet, which, you know, two diamonds do. Uh, there's another turn bet we call again. Again, our draws are going to do that. We just happen to have a different draw than what we're now trying to represent on the river. Uh, so we had one draw, the other draw came in, and we've got a very rev- relevant card to one of those draws. Uh, so it, it checks out in terms of the story from start to end, uh, which is what makes this effective. Yeah, you really, if, if you're not feeling like, I don't quite understand blockers as well i'm not this is a bluff to sort of work into your game in later stages like the earlier ones we talked about uh start practicing those first um because if you do this incorrectly you're going to be going home because your tournament's going to be over uh and if you do this against the wrong customer they may not even realize what you're doing and they're gonna you know call you with their what do we got here i mean their king nine or their king, you know, whatever that, you know, they're just going to be like, oh, I call. Um, and so you've got to pick the right customer for this kind of play. All right. Any other thoughts on that before we get into a little bit more on bluff theory, and then we're going to get into some examples. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a small thing, but um, I feel like most players or at least most recreational players notice the most when three to a flush comes out, meaning that it's that third diamond out there. They've kind of had their hand burnt before uh, by someone who, you know, rivered the flush on them. So for some reason, they're a little bit more kind of aware of those types of things. Uh, If it's, you know, a open-ended straight draw that uh, hits on the river, those probably should be a little bit less bluffed by you if you have, you know, potentially a relevant blocker in that situation in terms of, okay, you know, 10-9 made the nut straight here on the river and I have a 10. Should I be, you know, turning this into a blocker bluff in this spot? It's probably less so because people aren't really that keenly aware of those situations. But for some reason, everyone notices when that third of a suit comes in on the board, uh, it automatically scares them. So this is just one of those great spots where people notice these. And I think the reason for that is um, if nine ten is the nut straight, that means it's a bunch of low cards. And you talk to any recreational player and the guy they're playing against usually has ace king. So um, they're not going to have those little cards, but they could have that suited ace king. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's really, it's really true. They don't, they don't think that, uh, even though it's a blind, they don't think that the guy in a blind is going to be sitting there with a two five for the straight. Whereas, you know, he could already have a straight with the two five, right? But he's not seeing the straight, but he may be very concerned with that flush. There, that's a very good point that Taylor made because people don't notice that so much, but a guy could be sitting there with uh, 10 Jack of diamonds. 
you know, are a Jack 10 of diamonds or a King Queen of diamonds. You know, they're, those are more likely hands that an opponent is going to be going after you with than two five. Mm -hmm. If I had two five here, I would be furious to see a diamond river. Even if you told me <laughs> my opponent 100% of the time does not have two diamonds. Yeah. Because I know it ruins my value that I would have gotten. Exactly. You're yeah. exactly right there. That That is the worst part about some of the bluffs that you want to try to pull off is when the, the card that, <laughs> I guess the card that you don't want that kills the action. I guess is what it is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Well, John Somsky is taking a, I was going to say much needed vacation, but does he even really do anything around here? He, he, he talks a big game. It always seems like he's busy, but uh, I don't know. I guess the monthly home games, the nightly home games, all the updates and stuff like that, plus all the stuff he does for the podcast that uh, you don't get to see. All right, let's give him a few days off. So I'm going to fill in here. On June 1st is the monthly No Limit on uh, July. See, this is a lot harder. John makes it look so easy. On July 1st is the No Limit Hold'em monthly mixed game series. Come in and uh, win some points in the player of the year race and get a special bronze pin for the monthly game there. And the next Wednesday on July 8th is the mixed game. This week, this month, it's triple stud. And there is a video coming soon. We'll put that up on the website. I hope everyone else enjoys watching that because I've pledged not to learn any of the mixed games until we start playing. That was a lot of fun on Badoogie Month. Oh, man. <laughs> Hopefully this one's got a slightly less steep learning curve. We'll see. Triple stud. Uh, on June 15th, Keck Geek Jacob K won the, his second SDS. On June 16th, Eric Molina, Rob Barrett, who I've been calling Eric in the chat this whole time. So you're Rob now to me. I got you, buddy. Um, I Hate to Lose was on June 17th. William a Alexander on June 18th, Rick, the good dog, Rick rock Omen winning his first SDS way to go, Rick on June 19th, Chad McVean coming in with his second, a little team Canada flavor. I happen to know he also won Mike Patrick's home game that night. So the coveted two for two way to go, Chad on June 20th, a very special day. Uh, rec poker, Steve came through and won one, uh, won the home game for Jim. So thanks buddy. A little birthday love there. And on June 21st, Oreo Milk 4444, Owen Drabeck, uh, one of two great Drabecks that play in the home game. Uh, and congratulations to Owen. Yeah, All also right. a fun piece of uh, tidbit that I just learned. I haven't tried it out, but apparently you can now play the Poker Stars home game on a mobile device, which is a, a game changer for those that can't always have a laptop with them. So uh, yeah, if you're one of those people that were limited by the needing to have a laptop or not always having your phone with you, this could be a game changer for you with the, uh, the rec poker social distancing series. That means I'm going to make a few extra. Yeah, exactly. Same here. <laughs> so, supposedly the Apple one's coming soon and the Android one's already available. So yeah. Okay. Uh, ah. wait, and I think the Apple one's within the next week. So nice. hopefully we can all get on there real soon. Cool. Hey, we had our first uh, book study um, last Wednesday. It was well attended. We had a couple of, of members join us, which was really fun. We got a lot of good conversation. We just went over the first, uh, you know, the introduction and some of the uh, things to do bef when you're playing in a poker tournament, things you want to watch for. We're going to get into the real meat and potatoes starting on July 1st. Uh, we're going to be doing rules they're they're set up in rules so we're going to be doing rules one two three and four uh hopefully we'll get through them all there could be a lot of uh discussion around all those but anyway we're going to do that on july 1st and hope some of the members can come and join us and join in the discussion it it was really a lot of fun also we do have a twitter contest going on um it ends this wednesday on the 24th and uh, you just have to go to Rec Poker, find the video that Steve put out there on Twitter, um, and retweet that or reply to it. And you will be entered into a drawing for a PDF version of The Game Plan by Matt Matros, which happens to be the book we're studying in our book study. Wow. <laughs> and you'll have it just in time. You'll have it just in time to read up and catch up to where we're at and be ready to go for July 1st. So good luck.
what are the odds that that's the book that we're going to be studying? It's crazy. Man, we got so it lucky just there. Amazing, oh, wasn't it? Wow. <laughs> and speaking of members, uh, we are wrapping up June. Uh, still three betting month. Um, the Strat Chat will be this Wednesday, June 24th, 8 p.m. Central. If you're a member, we hope to see you there. Bring your questions. Otherwise, we'll be just going over some, probably some video hands or hand histories or something like that. But we'd, we'd love to have you join us and just kind of uh, chat poker. And we are gearing up. Uh, actually, as soon as this podcast uh, ends recording, we're going to gear up to uh, for our July seminar, uh, which is going to be all about bluffing. So uh, I can't, it's going to be a really good conversation. I'm really excited uh, for that coming in July. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, this Wednesday, June 24th, 6.30 p.m. Central Time, uh, we're going to be doing more learning with content partners. Uh, we're going to be looking at some premium content from Red Chip and Learn Pro Poker. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited for that one. Uh, also, don't forget to check out rec.poker slash resources. Uh, that's where you can get all of the good deals that are going on right now. Solve for Y, $9.99. Also, Learn Pro Poker is still running their summer sale. Uh, membership $30 a month or three Oh five annually. Uh, that ends July 1st. So you want to take advantage of that, but you can, but don't forget Wednesday, June 24th, 6 30 PM. Nice. And, uh, before Steve sends us out, I just want to take a minute to say thank you so much to everybody who took part in that little birthday video project that Steve was taking care of. I got to celebrate 40 years young on the weekend and it, it, it was extremely touching to see all the messages from everybody. And uh, I'm so glad <laughs> Rob even got a chance to pick up a Grolsch for the first time. He was very excited about that. I, I, as Rick, Rick Day, I really have to shout out for a wonderful, wonderful video. So, but thank you all so much. It really meant the world to me. And uh, uh, thanks again. It's, I'm so happy to be a part of this group. And uh, I just can't thank you enough. So thanks again. Steve, let us out of here, man. All right. Thanks, guys. The only thing that I would add uh, for my own stuff is last week we did our latest monthly play and hang. It was super, super fun. Uh, Troy Graffentine ended up taking it down, but uh, myself, Andrew Feist, Rob Brereton, Rick Day, Gorob Aurora, and David Bear all uh, participated in that thing. Uh, congrats to Troy, but really it was the hanging out was the well, the fun part of it, get to know each other. We also had, had uh, Sarah Herring from the Poker News stop by, and she hung out for like over an hour. Uh, talking about life with a new baby, but also uh, she had an accident, broke her leg, shattered all three bones. Uh, I don't mean to laugh, but it's it's an amazing story. Uh, but she talked about that. So she's sort of in the recovery mode, having the baby. Life is very different for her. No World Series. Uh, so we had a great opportunity just to kind of catch up with her and talk about that. Uh, we are releasing that uh, video, I believe, to the public. Uh, so you'll all get a chance to watch that and kind of hear from Sarah as we just hung out and played poker. Uh, if you are a, a member at Rec.Poker, if you played in our home game, uh, you're eligible eligible for these monthly playing hangs where we have different people. Uh, we have eight of us that play in the tournament. Then we have somebody pop in and say hi. Uh, last month, uh, we had, who did we have? Maria Ho, Chris Moneymaker, Lexi Gavin uh, jumped in as well. So you never know who's going to show up to these things. So make sure that you're playing the home game. Make sure that you become a member. Uh, you can be eligible for those uh, cool opportunities as well. Oh, one, one more thing, I guess. Um, we do merchandise orders at the end of the month. So if you want some merch, Get in touch with me before June 30th. Uh, we got some some more po folks that want some more merchandise. We'll put out some more uh, notifications. But if you want some merchandise, get in touch. Go to rec.poker slash merchandise. Uh, check it out. All the info's there. And then just email me with what you want. And we'll place the order on that deal. So with that, uh, thanks again to our sponsors, Running Aces, Racetrack, Casino, and Hotel, Website, Amp, Learn Pro Poker. Uh, thanks to our panel, uh, especially Chris Jones for leading putting all of that member content together, the seminar, the bluffing stuff, great stuff there. Uh, we'll check, we'll, uh, yeah, I guess we'll shout with you all next week. Take care.